and probably the most famous other verse besides joy, 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 uh, you're going to have to help me. I, we've, it's kind of interesting. We found this week that, uh, that there's like a 30 age. We kind of tell if you're 30 or not. Um, if you're over 30, you know you're going to be able to tell me the rest of this verse. If you're under 30, you're like, what? I've never heard of this before. We also found out a couple people in church are lying about their age, but that's a that's, that's <laughs> story for um, All right, so kids, listen to your parents and your grandparents. Listen to us adults tell you uh, how the rest of this verse. You, you guys finish this sentence for me. If the devil doesn't like it, he can. <laughs> Sit on attack. That's exactly right. Um, well, it is important for us to sing and to be happy to express that joy that Christ has put into our heart whether we're children whether we're teenagers whether we're adults whether we're grandparents it's still important for us and sometimes it's good to remember that Christ put that joy in our hearts because as as we get older and some of the cares of the world begin to press down on us sometimes we don't live like we have joy in our hearts. Sometimes it's kind of hard to notice we have joy in our hearts. And that is something that Christ has given us. So it's important for us to be able to express that. Before we look at God's word, let's pause. Father in heaven, we just thank you that we can come before you today and just express the joy that is in our hearts. Express the joy of knowing you, of having Jesus Christ as Lord of our life. Lord, I just pray that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would teach us through your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to experience, to live, to communicate the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we ask this, that the name of our Lord and, Jesus, Lord and Savior might be lifted up in our hearts and in our lives. It's through him that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we're in John chapter 16. We're going to begin reading in verse 16. A little while, and you will see me no longer, and again a little while, and you will see me. So some of the disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me, and a little while, and you will see me, but, and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you were asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. As we look at this passage, remember the context. We are talking about what it means to be living for Jesus. Uh, we began this section. Jesus said he's divine, we're the branches. We need to live abiding in him. We need to live our lives in Jesus. And then he's kind of talked about what that means, what that looks like to live in Jesus. Well, I'm to love one another. Okay, that's different. Uh, we'll be different from the world if we love one another. And so we saw that. Well, that's, that's what we ought to do. And, and that's something you would think the world would love us for. But no, actually the world will hate us, Jesus says. And they'll try to kill us. In fact, they'll kill Christians and say, hey, whoa, I'm doing a service to the world by killing other Christians. So how do we deal with that? We're loving one another. We are supposed to be loving people. The world hates us. Well, last week we looked at one of the ways we deal with that. Jesus sends his spirit, and his spirit is convicting the world. Even those same people who are hating us, Jesus' spirit is convicting them, showing them that Jesus loves them and died for them. So we have a partnership with God in, in expressing that love. Well, that's great, but how's that help me every day? How's that help me kind of make it through the day? Well, Jesus shows us another thing that helps us with the fact that the world hates us, and that is he has changed our hearts in many ways. One of those ways is that he has put joy in our hearts. Not only do we have love in our hearts, we have joy in our hearts. Now, to get there, let's remember, we will be in jeopardy. Jesus is talking about they need to live with him, abide in him, and in the middle of talking 
about all that. It says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. As a disciple, it's like, what does this mean? What does a little while mean, and what does it mean in the context that we won't see him? We see Jesus every day. We live with Jesus. We've walked with Jesus. Everywhere we go, Jesus is there. For three years, it's been Jesus here, Jesus there. Jesus is leading us all around. Now know Jesus? What, what are we going to do with that? Uh, we've devoted our lives to him. We believe he's the one sent from God, and now he's not going to be around? How do we deal with that? And Jesus says it's going to be bad. Jesus says you're going to weep and lament. Yes, it is going to be tough. Um, things are going to be bad. He's obviously referring to the crucifixion. It's going to be so bad that they're going to kill me. I've said the world's going to hate Christians, and they, they hate you because of me. I'm the one they really hate, and they hate me so much they're going to kill me. And at the same time, you're weeping and lamenting. At the same time, this one that you've followed around for three years, you've been devoting your life to, is gone. The world is going to rejoice. They're not going to have a Jesus is dead, sorrow, feel bad day. They're not going to make this a holiday. They're going to rejoice because they finally killed me. They're going to say, hey, this is a great thing. If they make it a holiday, it'll be a ding-dong Jesus is dead day, not a day of sorrow. And you know, even in this world, even today, Finality of death brings grief. There's no way for me to sugarcoat that. I don't want to make it sound like we should never be sad, we should never be sorrowful. Obviously, bad things happen in the world. Bad things happen short of death. People are, are hurt. People are, are in bad situations. And, and, and that causes grief. That causes sorrow. As, as long as we are in the world, there will be sorrow. We know that even Christians are killed. We know in the 20th century, more Christians were killed in the name of Jesus than in the previous 19 centuries combined. It's still going on. If anything, it's worse. We know in our own lives, sometimes the venom of hate brings grief. That, that people just hate us because we're Christians, because of what we stand for, because we actually do uh, rejoice, because we have love in our hearts. The world just hates that. That causes us to have grief. That's going to happen. That's going to be the case as we live in the world. But it's not the end of this passage. Yes, we will be in jeopardy, but we will see Jesus. Jesus says, in a little while you will see me no longer. And again in a little while you will see me. The disciples don't know what that means either. We won't see him for a while, but then we will, and we won't see him. And it's not like he just went back to say hi to Mary, and maybe it's Mary's birthday, and they're going over and have a little party or whatever. And we know, okay, well, you know, he'll, he'll be back. Because that's not, we, we wouldn't have grief and sorrow because he went to Mary's birthday party. I mean, it, well, it's going to be really bad, but then he's going to be back. So what in the world is he talking about? How does, how does all this happen? What, what does he possibly mean in this context? And so Jesus explains this further. He says, look, I know you don't understand. I know what you you're, want to ask me, and so let me answer that question for you. Some people think this refers to the second coming. I don't believe it does. I believe this refers to the resurrection. Right. Jesus says, look, you're not going to see me because I'm going to die on the cross, but then you will see me, and you'll rejoice soon after we're talking about the resurrection. And, and I believe that based upon the context of what's been going on here in this section where Jesus is talking about being divine. He says he's going to send, we looked at this last week, he's going to send his Holy Spirit. And we're going to live with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Okay, well that is obviously between the resurrection and the second coming. And then Jesus is going to talk about praying. We're going to look at that next week. Well, there's not going to be any need to pray when we get to heaven uh, because we're going to be there with God. So uh, praying obviously is something from the resurrection to the second coming. Back earlier, when we looked at the vine and the branches, when we first looked at that passage, back in 15, John 15, 11, uh, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Obviously, Jesus is talking about us being the vine and the branches in this life, uh, and from the resurrection to the second coming, and 
that produces joy. So there is joy between the resurrection and the second coming, that joy that we must have today. What I want to remind you is this. Don't miss the joy and purpose of life, of this life, by making everything about the life to come. We're going to talk about heaven, and we believe in heaven, and heaven is a great place. And I'm not, I don't want to, again, I don't want to shortchange heaven. But we have a life right now between the time that we ask Jesus to come into our heart and that time he calls us home. And it's a life filled with joy. It's a life where we walk with Jesus. And let's not miss the joy of that life and what Jesus wants to accomplish in us, what Jesus wants to provide for us as we walk through this life. And we're always thinking about life. I remember I was about five or six years old. My parents divorced when I was five. And my mom had been a stay-at-home mom before then. She had to go get a job uh, now uh, to take care of us, and she found a job. Uh, she answered the phones, worked the switchboard, some of you know what that is, uh, or a hospital in town. And so she would have, she would work the third shift. And we would be uh, with dad on the weekends, but we didn't see him any other time, and then mom would be off a couple days a week. Uh, but there were three or four nights where we had to go to bed with grandma and grandpa, grandma and grandpa's house. Um, and it was already, I did not like the fact that dad wasn't around anymore. And then to go to bed without mom being around, I just really wasn't a big fan. Um, and, and my grandma and grandpa must have been saints, because I think they put up with this. I, I can remember more than one occasion, this was probably an every night thing, where I just didn't want to go to bed. My mom wasn't there, and I didn't want to go to bed. I didn't want to have anything to do with that. And it, and I remember one of the ways they tried to comfort me, and, and, and they did have some success. I mean, it wasn't like I said, oh, okay, well, that's great. But they would always say, go ahead and go to sleep, and then when you wake up, Mom will be here in the morning. I didn't like what I was going through. I didn't like what life was dealing with me at that particular time. But they knew and they were telling me that things will be better tomorrow. And they were telling me that I've got my mom. She's there. She's not physically right there now, but she's there. She's not going anywhere. And I know that she's going to be there with me in the morning. Jesus is saying, look, I know this is going to be tough. I know you aren't going to like what you're going through, and it's going to be a difficult time for you. But I want you to understand there's hope that in the morning I'm going to be there. Amen. And sure enough, on resurrection morning, Jesus came back. Amen. And Jesus was there. We will be in jeopardy. We will see Jesus. And quite simply, we will have joy. Amen. The disciples' temporary grief will be turned to joy, Jesus says, when he rises from the dead. And he has this, uh, he gives this story about childbirth. Now, how many of you are not an only child? Raise your hand. If you're not an only child, Okay, evidently Jesus knows what he's talking about because when our parents had one child, they decided to have another one. And as bad as childbirth was for mom, she decided it was worth it because she kept having more children. And if it wasn't worth it, we'd all be only children, right? <laughs> Every woman in the world would go, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> but... What happens, Jesus says, is yes, it is a bad experience. It is painful. It, it is a bad situation. But somehow, the joy from the baby coming into the world cancels out all that sorrow of childbirth. Jesus says, look, all of the sorrow of me being gone, all of the sorrow that you go through in this life, is going to be canceled out by the joy that is yours, knowing me. He says a statement that's interesting, that I find it incredibly interesting. I think it's important for us to, to think about and to dig down. He says in verse 22, 
I will see you again in your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Now, if you've been a Christian very long and been around other Christians very much, you know that there are a lot of Christians, people who will tell you they're followers of Christ, who seem to be a long way from any joy. But the Bible says, if you're a Christian, your joy can't be taken from you. So to me, what that means is, you've made a decision. We've made a decision that I'm not going to call up that joy. That I'm not going to rely on that joy. I'm going to let whatever the heartaches of this world are, all the bad things, tamp down so tight in my heart that the joy can't even get out anymore. And that's not Christ's will for our lives. Look, Jesus doesn't say, oh, you know, no big deal. Yeah, things are going to be bad, but don't worry about it. He says, no, it's going to be really bad. You're going to be in sorrow. You're going to, be, you're going to lament. You're, it is going to hurt what's going to happen. But I have placed my joy within you. And in the midst of those things, in the midst of those difficulties, you can call on Jesus Christ. And there is joy in life. There is joy even in the midst of grief. How do you access that joy? Well, you see, every one of us has sinned against God. None of us is perfect. None of us is righteous. We have all said, God, I'm in charge here. I'll do what I want to do. And we do that in different ways, but it's all sin. That's what sin is. And when we separate ourselves from the source of all life, when we sin, the consequences of that is death. And that's broken. That's bad. That's sorrowful. That's miserable. Yes. But God doesn't want us to be like that. So in the fullness of time, he said Jesus, this same Jesus, would eventually die on a cross. And in dying on a cross, he paid the price for all the sin of all of humanity of all time. He took death for us. The consequences of separating ourselves from the source of all life is death, but Jesus paid the price for our sin by dying in our place. And then he rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father, where he rules and reigns in majesty. If you will simply admit that you've sinned against God, believe that Jesus paid the price, died on a cross for your sin, and allow the risen Christ to now be the Lord of your life, to rule your life, to be your God, the Bible says you will be saved. See, for those of us who have made that decision, who have received Jesus, the New Testament tells us there will be grief. Romans chapter 12, verses 16 through 25, Paul talks about the grief that we will experience. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for it with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in order that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now, hope that is not seen is not hope, or hope that is seen is hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. <coughs> creation is is groaning, it is, is longing for the day that we are reconciled to God and we are part of that creation. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We know that. We understand that. There are consequences of sin in this life. There are people who will hurt you because they're sinning. There, there are consequences of sin just because of general sin in the world. That death reigns because there's sin in the world because uh, ever, ever since the fall. So whether it's just general consequences of sin or somebody's sin against you or it's sometimes our own sin, 
the consequences of our own sin, there's sorrow in the world. But God has given us a down payment on joy. The first fruits of joy, and the first fruits is he's placed his spirit within us. And the joy of knowing Christ and the joy of having a relationship with him has come into our hearts. Sometimes that grief is not just from sin. Sometimes that grief is from testing or from suffering or from something specifically related to our life and our walk with Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised that the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You know, it's hard to understand. It's hard to really get your mind around. But when someone condemns you, when someone persecutes you, when someone hates you, when someone kills you because you are a Christian, we should rejoice. Because God has made that kind of an impact in our life. He has changed us so dramatically that the world wants to get rid of us. That the world wants to dismiss us. The world wants to push us aside. It's only the power of God that does that. Yeah. And we should have joy knowing that God can make such a radical difference in our lives. And then... We know that sometime we will face death. Hopefully it'll be a nice ripe old age. It could be being persecuted. It could be because we belong to Christ. But we know that whenever death comes and the finality of death comes, that we can rejoice because indeed there is joy in the morning. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, or 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance which is imperishable and defiled and fading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith in us for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that... The tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in glory, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. Rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See, we have a God, you have a God, who loves you so much that when you separated yourself from him, when you said, no, God, I'll be in charge here, I think that fitting in with the crowd and doing drugs, fitting in with the crowd and, and drinking too much, fitting in with the crowd, doing stupid things that I've drunk too much, fooling, fitting in with the crowd and, and uh, doing whatever the crowd wishes, Deciding what's best for me, what will make me feel good, making fun of others, uh, saying bad things to folks of other races, people of opposite gender, uh, mistreating uh, other people, having sex outside of marriage, whatever it is, I'll feel good doing whatever I want to do. And when we have separated ourselves from God and done that, God has come after every one of us. And it doesn't matter how bad the thing you did. You may have killed somebody, and God still is coming after you. God loves you and wants a relationship with you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you to come after you. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he took away all your sin. He took away the consequence of all your sin. And he wants to have a relationship with you. The God of all creation. The God who said, let there be light and the sun shone, wants to have a relationship with you. And if that shouldn't put joy in your heart, then what will? And that same God has prepared a place for you in his presence. Imagine how wonderful this world is with, with the sun and the moon and the leaves and the uh, just the... The, the beauty of nature and, and the relationships you have with people here in this life and, and all those sorts of things. Uh, this world that groans because of sin, 
God has prepared a place for you where there is and has never been sin. Imagine the joy inexpressible in that place, a down payment of that you have right now with the Spirit dwelling within you. The first fruits of that we have, a little bit from the beginning of the Spirit dwelling within us. We have the joy, 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 joy down in our hearts because Jesus lives within us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And because the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the joy that is to be revealed. 